it's my job to introduce the panel. You've already heard me introduce Jay McInerney. I'm not going to say one word about it. <laughs> <laughs> this man right here is Gary Fiskajohn. Read along with Jay. Vice President and editor. Is it anything other than an editor at Alfred A. Knopf? No. Czar. Editor, right. editor at large. That's why I'm up Editor there. at large at Alfred A. Knopf. Credited with having revolutionized the publishing industry with his creation of Vintage Contemporary Series, which hugely expanded the readership for contemporary literary fiction. He is one of our, I, I know you wouldn't know it, but he is one of our most distinguished and successful literary editors, having worked with, among many others, Raymond Carver, Richard Ford, Joy Williams, Cormac McCarthy, Annie Dillard, Haruki Murakami, and even Jim Jay, Shepard. Jay McInerney and Jim Shepard. <laughs> <laughs> this son of a bitch will work with anybody. <laughs> Next to him, Karen Shepard, who many of you already know, but it's always nice to be reminded. She's the author of three critically acclaimed, and what would you say, Karen, moderately successful novels? I would say almost not successful at all. <laughs> unsuccessful? Critically acclaimed and disastrously unsuccessful novel. <laughs> an, empire, Utterly. 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 an empire of women, the bad boy's wife. <laughs> <laughs> and a novel based on her recent meeting with Gary Fiskajohn, Don't I Know You. <laughs> She's had her nonfiction published all over the place, and her short fiction has appeared in, among other places, The Atlantic Monthly. Tin House, Plowshares, and uh, ESPN. <laughs> <laughs> Next to her, Carrie Ryan. I know many of you are thinking, is that a woman who's done a zombie trilogy? Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> She's the author of a highly successful, highly is the right adverb, right? Highly successful and critically acclaimed series of YA novels set as so many novels now are, <laughs> decades after the zombie apocalypse. <laughs> I thought that happened, Jim. No, no, it hasn't happened yet. The inevitable zombie apocalypse. <laughs> you know, if you get really drunk, it's not technically a zombie apocalypse. It <laughs> can <laughs> Her books are called, although we'd love to chatter some more, <laughs> The Forest of Hands and Teeth. Very nice title. Um, that, I think that came out of a mission basement party, didn't it? The Forest of Hands and Teeth. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, the Dead Tossed Waves um, and the forthcoming Dark and Hollow Places, is that right? Mm -hmm. uh, and the Forest of Hands and Teeth was chosen as a best book for young adults by the American Library Association, who, by the way, should be choosing more wholesome fare. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, this, ladies and gentlemen, I am sad to say, is your panel. <laughs> and now I am sitting down. <laughs> Okay, so I, I'm moderating. <laughs> God, I know, it's a, it's a sad state of affairs. Um, so I'm going to ask a few questions, throw it out to the panelists, the esteemed panelists, and then I'm hoping that you guys will um, ask the questions that have been burning inside of you for the last hour or maybe even longer. Um, so, so we put this panel together as a panel on the writing life. Um, or making a living as a writer. Um, so I thought I'd ask the panelists um, what that means to you, what that has meant to you, what that means from an editorial point of view, what that means from a writing point of view. Um, I imagine it's changed from the time you started out to now. Um, so would you just talk for a few minutes about how you define the writing life for yourselves? Well, it has changed a lot. <laughs> Please, ladies, no, you, ladies no, first. No, please, you go. <laughs> well, I, I can <laughs> have a... <laughs> right. Since I actually Jerry got a, go first. I got a job out of this deal. <laughs> However, when, when Jay and I were at Williams, and we graduated in 76, you know, we worked at a long defunct magazine called Peak, which was a literary magazine. And, you know, he wrote, if memory serves, really good poems, I wrote really shitty stories. <laughs> and yeah, and we worked on this magazine. 
and I graduated with degrees in history, philosophy, literature, I can't remember. <laughs> All of which were guaranteed to give me a really good job. <laughs> then as and well. which was to say, graduate school. <laughs> and then I had a couple of friends who must have been retarded. They had thought about publishing as a way of life and had gone to the what was then at Radcliffe, a publishing procedures course it was called, which is now shifted to Columbia. And I said, why didn't I ever think of that? Because <laughs> I'd never figured, I'd never wondered where books had come from. Um, I knew it, I couldn't do anything else, and I kind of lucked into it. Meanwhile, Jay, who was a real writer, as a, a pretend writer, you know, I wanted to do it. He went about wasting years of his life, <laughs> as you must, in order <laughs> to learn how to write. And it takes a long time. Um, yeah. So I lucked into my life. Um, Jay lucked into his. I mean, and it takes a long time. But that's my little spiel. And now we have two... Well, for, you know, for, fortunately, but when I when I finally um, when I finally had something um, that might be remotely publishable, Gary, Gary was in place uh, at Random House. Um, but it's true. Uh, I'm, I'm afraid that I'm afraid that misdirection and um, and improvisation and false starts are 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 characteristic of the early stages of the writing life. Um, when I when I graduated from Williams, I had a friend who had preceded uh, me to um, Japan, and he he uh, he was a serious uh, scholar of Japanese culture. But but he he told me that it was a very um, it was very easy to um, uh, to teach uh, English a few hours a week and um, and, and and support yourself uh, in Japan and really. Uh, the imperative that every young writer is faced with is how do you somehow make a living while still allowing yourself the time to uh, the, waste the, a lot of the, time to write. The incredible, yeah, the incredible amount of time it, it, it takes to to apprentice yourself to um, the, the the writing of. Uh, I'm speaking of fiction now. Um, you know, non nonfiction. It seems um, the the paths are um, are clearer. Um, uh, I actually tried to get a newspaper job uh, initially, but uh, unfortunately for me, Woodward and Bernstein had just be, uh, had just broken the Watersca Watergate scandal and had made journalism the most uh, popular profession <laughs> in the country shortly before I graduated, and um, it was it was really hard to get a job in journalism. Uh, I went off to um, to Japan where I did teach English and um, and and wrote uh, for two years. Uh, sub subsequently, I, I returned to New York and tried to um, make a living as a freelance writer uh, uh, of, of reviews and mostly book reviews and um, critical essays, uh, which, which proved pretty tough. Um, uh, I made about $600 that first year. Um, <laughs> Was it hard and, to write while you were doing that? Um, well, I didn't do much of it. So it wasn't that hard. It was, it was my nightlife was what really took a toll on my writing. But, um, but I, I, I subsequently Gary got me a job as a. Um, at, I don't think this job exists any longer, Gary. But I, but I, I was the last reader. I was the reader of the slush pile at Random House, which means all the unsolicited manuscripts. And uh, Gary, I met, Gary managed to get me an office and. A big pile of manuscripts that I would, that I would read. I would add that Toni Morrison was then an editor at Random House. This is before she became the famous Toni Morrison, mm. and that obliged her to show up a couple of days every year almost. <laughs> and Jay read all of these, yeah. you know, stacks of manuscripts with these heartfelt letters saying, "Dear Toni Morrison." It would mean anything if you even read two pages of this and told me to go fuck off. <laughs> this fell to Jay. <laughs> but he was the last one there ever was. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and when that job disappeared, um, I actually lucked in, again, through a connection of Gary's, um, 
Thank God for Gary. Uh, yeah, I, I, yeah. I, I, here's my advice: is have a patron if you can. <laughs> <laughs> but um, G Gary, um, Gary was working with a writer named Jane Kramer, who then worked for the New Yorker, or still works for the New Yorker, and. Um, uh, the, she told him that there was an opening for a fact checker at the New Yorker. And uh, so I immediately rushed in to apply for the job of a fact checker at the New Yorker. The, the good news was that it was the New Yorker, which is, this was the height of my literary aspirations. This was, you know, this was essentially the, the center of its the, time. The center of literary New York, as far as, as, as we, we could tell. Um, um, the New Yorker was, it was a dream come true to work for the New Yorker. The bad news, though, is that I was a fact checker. And um, um, I've never been very good with facts. Um, <laughs> I, I'm with David Byrne, who says facts all come with points of view. Facts don't do what I want them to. And, um, and indeed, uh, eventually, the New Yorker discovered my, um, <laughs> my lack of, of, of um, True. of factual, a factual accuracy, um, my, 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 my relative disregard for the facts. And I was, I was unceremonious. After, after about 11 months of, of hanging on by my fingernails, I was, I was finally unceremoniously fired from The New Yorker. I think it was... Uh, One of the first. I think I was the first person <laughs> ever to be fired from The New Yorker. It's, it's, it's sort of like Harvard. Once you get in, they, you, know, you can kind of stay. But in, in my case, my, my performance was so egregious that... Um, that I was asked to leave. I had I'd actually misrepresented myself a little bit on my resume, saying that I was fluent in French when, when, when my, my, ability, my French abilities were, were far from fluent. So, so they gave me, ironically, one of Jane Kramer was then the Paris correspondent. They gave me one of Jane Kramer's pieces to fact check. And I had to call up. She wasn't fluent in French either. Yeah, she was, true. <laughs> And she gave me a very messy manuscript, which I was forced to, which I was asked to clean up. And um, and unfortunately, most of the people that I had to talk to didn't speak English, and um, it was it was very awkward, um, <laughs> to say the least. Uh, and yet I persisted, and I, I I tried to fake my way through that experience as I have so, so many times. <laughs> and uh, I was I was caught out, and I was asked to leave. And um, at that point, Gary came to my rescue again by introducing me to Raymond Carver, who was then teaching at Syracuse University. And I took the refuge of a last resort for, for writers, which was that I returned to school. Um, but I have to say that, um, you know, for all of the abuse that the, the idea of, of the MFA of, of creative writing school um, takes in our culture, and certainly in other cultures, uh, the Europeans can't understand this at all. But, it can be finally very helpful to to have a refuge and to be among like-minded people, uh, uh, and to I, this was the first time I, I, I got a small fellowship. This is the first time uh, since I graduated from Williams that I was actually able to devote most of my time to writing fiction instead of uh, worrying about how to make a living and checking facts or reading horrible unsolicited manuscripts uh, and um, and in the end that was that was where I wrote uh, my first um, well the 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 first piece I wrote, um, read today I wrote while I was a graduate student at, uh, at Syracuse and um, and I still think that um, many of many of uh, America's uh, best writers, um, even just many of America's writers go through the, um, the, the MFA um, system. And, uh, and it, is not, it is not a bad thing. Um, well, more uh, go through now than probably when you yeah. went through it, right? Yeah. I mean, there are many, many more going through yeah, it. Yeah, even back in the dark ages, even there were MFA programs. <laughs> Did you go to an MFA program? Uh, no, I went to law school. Right. <laughs> oh, much God. smarter. Much wow. smarter. Much better idea. <laughs> I didn't realize there was. That's, such a thing that's as what MFA. my that's what my parents wanted me to do. <laughs> <laughs> it was one of those. I was one of those students who, if career counseling wasn't like hand feeding you something, then I didn't know it existed. Um, so I, um, because I graduated in 2000, I started an internet company, which. Whew, real fast. Um, and, uh, and thankfully, a school called and they had need of a teacher uh, at boarding school. And so I went and worked for them. It was such an, you know, I was 
I was not actually teaching classes. I was their technology coordinator, which means I had to sit in front of my computer and look like I was doing very important things, and the very important things were writing romance novels. <laughs> because I wanted to make a living writing, and, uh, and I wrote... And you knew that wouldn't happen <laughs> with literary fiction. <laughs> and, I, and I wasn't a literary writer. I didn't... Um, I still don't think, but, um, and so I wrote a couple of romance novels, and that was right when Chick Lit was becoming really important, so that, um, that William's intuition kicked in, and I thought, well, I really think I could write Chick Lit, I'm that age for it, but I've never lived in a city, so what I'll do is, I'll apply to law school, I'll go to law school, when I graduate from law school in three years, I will move to a big city, and then I will experience big city life, and then I can write about big city life. <laughs> Long-term planning, in which, in did, which point did, Chick Lit went whoo. Didn't you ever just think of moving to New York? <laughs> I was, I was not, uh, it was too scary for me. Um, and so, uh, and also I had, in writing two romance novels, I had realized that it's very difficult to make a living writing, and so I needed a backup plan, and so that was law school. Um, in law school, I thought I was too busy to write, and then I started practicing law, and I realized what busy is. And um, there's, a, there's a saying that becoming partner at a law firm is like uh, winning a pie eating contest where the prize is more pie. <laughs> and while I like pie, I did not like it that much. And um, I decided that I was going to dedicate myself wholly to writing. And I established this, I'm all about plans, I established this 10 year plan where for 10 years I would write and revise and submit. And uh, every rejection would just, I knew what I was gonna do and that was gonna be to continue on. And um, I wrote a couple of chick litty type YA books. And I loved YA because these were the books that I had fallen in love with growing up. These were the books that made me love uh, reading and writing. And, um, and finally, one day, I just had no ideas left. And I said to my husband, I don't, I don't know what to write anymore. And he said, he said, write what you love. And I, said, and I said, I said, that would be the zombie apocalypse. <laughs> he said, that's why I love you, honey. <laughs> and, uh, and it was, uh, you know, I, I fell in love with zombies because my husband had taken me to a zombie film. And, uh, you know, I always remember uh, in Jim Shepard's class, say, he, he said, uh, every author sort of has that, that one theme that they revisit over and over again in, in what they write. And I've sort of learned that for me, it's survival. It's, it's when you push someone to the past the point where you don't think that they can survive. Um, because for me, in the middle of the first zombie movie I watched, I thought I'd kill myself. Uh, <laughs> which was a very terrifying thought for me because I didn't ever, that's not how I viewed myself as a person. And so the theme I think I keep coming back to over and over again is, you know, let me, let me, let me, let me throw some teens up into space and strand them and see how far it takes for them to turn to cannibalism. <laughs> um, but uh, I wrote this, um, I wrote it was a post-zombie apocalypse book and I thought it would never sell because um, it was sort of a literary take on zombies. And um, I thought every agent in New York wouldn't laugh at me. And that, that I, clearly they have meetings where they go and they take the letters and like the slush pile and they and say, they laugh. Yeah, and they laugh. And they say, can you believe this? And um, Jay read a lot of this stuff. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and, uh, did you get a letter from Toni Morrison? That <laughs> no, I did. no. But I did end up at Random House. So, um, so it was really just a matter for me of, of you know, and I was a lawyer, and I think you're exactly right that the issue is finding time to write. And I gave up such important tasks as mowing the lawn and cleaning and cooking. But, but how, so, so Jay, you weren't really writing when you were being a fact checker and reading for Toni Morrison. And Carrie, you weren't really writing when you were in law school and working as a lawyer. I wrote. So the trick is to marry wealthy? Like, no, no. What, what, <laughs> how did you, just, when you said, I'm just going to devote myself to writing, not everyone has the luxury to be able to make that decision. Well, I, very, I was, very few people I've ever known have given up a career in law <laughs> to sort of say, going, I'm, I'm, going, I'm, I'm going for the zombie stuff. <laughs> well, it was right. I mean, I, I was lucky. I, I wrote zombies sort of right before, right as they were becoming popular. And, and I wrote... A what are zombies? <laughs> when was the, the zombie moment? The living dead. Gary, the come on. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, I came home from work and it would be, you know, I, was, I had a trial and I would put water on the stove to boil mac and cheese and for eight minutes, you know, you, that was what I would write. I would, you've never read Pride and Prejudice and Zombies? Classic. <laughs> so you would write after work. Right after work, yeah. You well, were going out after work. Yeah. So that was you had a not life. so much your writing time. I was I was writing, but not enough. I mean, well, one of the things that Raymond Carver said to me was, <coughs> was he said, look, 
if you're serious about this, you have to do it every day. And he said, you have to do it if you're feeling good. You have to do it if you're not feeling good. You have to do it if you're hungover. You have to do it at, at, a, at a regular time. Um, and, and, he said, and I said, do you do that? And he said, almost. He said, but, but he said, for a, for a certain number of years of my life, that was what I had to do in order to become a writer. And he convinced me that, you know, the occasional late night inspiration was not going to carry me, you know, to where I wanted to go. And um, uh, eventually I had to find the time to write every day. But, but it's, that, that, that is, that's the hardest part of all, and, unless you have a trust fund or you marry well. In my experience, um, at Williams and elsewhere, people who had trust funds uh, tended to be a little bit too lazy to follow through with this program. <laughs> Um, so, has there been a time in your lives when the writing life has been an utter disaster and not going well at all? And if so, I'm going to kind of assume there has been a time <laughs> like that in both of your lives. Um, how do you deal with that? How do you deal with when that one hour, or that eight minutes a day is either not available or you're not good at doing it or you're, I mean, I know that writers are um, excellent at procrastination. You know, my closets are all color coded and things like that. So, how, how have you dealt with the absolute bottom of the writing life? Um, well, there's two kinds of distractions that I experienced. And one, one was when I was trying to become a writer, and then after my first book was successful, I discovered that I could make a career out of talking about it right. and following it around the world, um, which was another form of distraction, um, nearly fatal. Um, you know, there, I, I just recently attended a, um, a writer's conference in Jaipur, India. Uh, I, 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 haven't, I haven't been to one of these in quite a long time, but I realized that there were people there who went to one after another of these writing conferences around the world, and um, you know, th there there is a way in which you can make a career out of being of, out of being a writer, uh, and 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 forget to right. to, to keep writing. Um, and I don't want to name any names, but that, um, oh, but ahead. but but the writing, but the, but the but the <laughs> you know the the post post -pub, post publication life can be a a, a trap in it. In itself, and um, that was—I I think that was probably the the uh, you know the the, the 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 low point in a way for me as a writer was was when uh, it, it seemed that I could just retire and and talk about my first book for the rest of my did life. Did you get out of that by yourself, or was there somebody who slapped you upside the head? Like Pro probably Gary. Gary. Yeah. I mean. <laughs> Thank God for Gary. Is the I mean, it, there, there, there's kind of a, a thing that comes to mind here. And, you know, once you achieve a kind of success, I mean, and, and nowadays even more so, I think with Facebook and social network and everything else, I mean, you're constantly trying to pimp yourself, which has nothing to do with writing. Um, a lot of writers complain bitterly if you say, well, we're trying to sell your book. And this is strictly from a publishing point of view. We believe in this book. You have to do this. You have to do that. And they hate it. What they hate even more is when we say, we're, you're not going to have a tour. And they say, are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> I mean, you're touring these other people, and I don't. you're not sending me anywhere? <laughs> And um, there's a, a wonderful book by a friend of mine called um, Kazuo Ishiguro, who achieves his great success, and then writes a book about, a very long book, about how difficult it is for somebody who's essentially living a life of promotion. That's an ordeal that you, you hurdle you have to cross down the line, but it is a fact of the writing life. <clears throat> now, I mean, Carrie, have you done a lot of... Oh, yeah. I mean, and also, I write for stuff? teens. I mean, yeah, I, I write for teens, and so the, the accessibility for Facebook and Twitter and um, Goodreads... Oh, Goodreads. Um, <laughs> and, then, and then, you know, I leave 
for a month touring. And and I and because it because I write for teens, that school visit, school visit, school visit, school visit, school visit, library, you know, or bookstore, and then fly. And it's in and I've just I I've talked to my editor and I'm like that's that's just it's a month out of the year that there I can't do I can't revise I can't hardly I can hardly call my husband. Yeah. Um, and it's and I think it's tough and I think I feel I feel like a lot of writers when they get into writing one of the first things they do is take on the trappings of writing. They have a blog, they have a Facebook page, they talk about writing, they talk about craft, but at the end of the day, they're not writing. And I think, um, I, think it's, I think it's a very lucky writer who can just focus on the writing, who doesn't have to sort of, um, you know, be responding on, on Twitter or Facebook, which I love in some cases, but in some cases can be, can be overwhelming. And, uh, and when you say sort of what keeps you going, I, I walked into the law firm one day, and again with this trial, and I was, you know, junior, junior, junior associate, and the partner pointed to a wall of banker boxes, probably like the size of that back wall, and up. And he said, um, I want you to hand count every page in those boxes. Oh my God. And I said, why? He's like, I want to drop a footnote and a motion that we had this many pieces of paper. And I'm like, can I just guesstimate 2,500 a box? He's like, no. And so every uh, time I think about if I'm going to keep writing, I right, think about alternative. this. I mean, you know, I mean, hand That's even worse than being Tony Morrison's slush breeder. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I love the idea here that, that the nadir is um, the sort of wild success that we've all had. Um, um, I, I was thinking more the nadir of like Dark Knight of the Soul kind of thing, where it's like, why would anyone want to listen to what I have to say? I don't even want to listen to what I have to say, right? Well... If you, I, I mean, you have to have a very big ego to even um, Start consider this in the first place. consider right. that anybody would want to be inside your head for seven or eight hours. Yeah, because um, it's a horrifying place to be for the most part. I mean, not your head, but my head. <laughs> um, it, I, it's it's a great act of presumption to um, to undertake uh, to become a writer, and um, uh, yeah, I, but I, I think. You know, almost every day of my life, I think, I worry about that. Uh, I, I guess I've just taken it for granted at this point. Right. It's part of the worry. You wake up and you say, oh, this is terrible what I'm writing. No one will like it. Uh, that's, that, that's, that's just a, a fact of the writing life, I think. So clearly, Jay and Gary, you've had an author-editor relationship that's very special for and very uh, unusual, I think. For yeah. Your, um, for a it is, I think it is. We, we met at Williams. Um, uh, uh, We've been doing this for... 30, 35 years. Yeah. More than Come 35 June. years. Yeah. <laughs> sir, 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 you know, the, the, <clears throat> we have different re recollections of how we met. Gary, Gary insists that my version is entirely fictional, but um, uh, we... Don't go there. <laughs> <laughs> there was a redhead from Wellesley involved, I heard. <laughs> but it's been, uh, it's, been, it's been a long time. And we, we, we actually, after almost... After almost uh, getting into a fist fight, we, we started trading books, and uh, we've been trading books ever since. And um, in fact, I remember one of the first hardcover books I bought, which wasn't a textbook, was Raymond Carver's first uh, collection of stories, uh, Will You Please Be Quiet, Please, which I then forced upon Gary and said, you've got to read this. And then Gary subsequently became Raymond Carver's editor. Um, I mean, that's just a lot of... Um, there, um, there's just a lot of that kind of back and so, forth. I mean, you know, one one thing that was kind of, you know, that, that comes to mind here is that I would write shitty stuff, he would write shitty stuff. I think he probably edited my shitty stuff. I certainly remember editing his stuff, but mm -hmm. to get, in, in, get into a frame of mind where you, you have somebody you can trust and work with them. Yeah. You know, I mean, nobody's going to teach anybody how to become a writer. Nobody can teach anybody how to read a book, for that matter. But but they can to help. get to have an interchange is is crucial. I mean, it, it made my life the fact that you know I would work on Jay's things and various classmates' things. I didn't have any kind of. I, I think it was a born editor and not a born writer. But I never felt weird about editing stuff. And 
I edit my own stuff. I, I read books that have been published, and I say, Jesus Christ, didn't anybody edit this? <laughs> it, it, and, and it's something that you can really, you know, take from. And Ray Carver, you know, our old friend, he was, and he couldn't type, I mean, he couldn't do anything. <laughs> but he would... He could drink. He would, once he got to the point where he didn't have to write shit out in crayon, he would pay somebody to write. I mean, when, when Jay was up at Syracuse, he had some typist, and he would scribble, he would go through 15 or 20 drafts and get this woman, you know, it was a good thing, a good gig for her in Syracuse, not a boom town. <laughs> she had a job, and he would just keep going over it and going over it, and that's the thing that I think that's the hardest thing for, for, for anybody who's starting out to, to appreciate, this doesn't come out in one go. Yeah. I mean, Faulkner says that, you know, he wrote As I Lay Dying in three and a half weeks to the drum of, you know, some, you know, heater and, uh, at Ole Miss. Maybe he did, maybe he was a liar. You, it, you have to work over this stuff so far, so many times, so long. How do you think and that just takes so much time yeah. and patience and belief in what you're doing. And, and a good editor. So, well, but no, this is even before the editor comes into yeah. play. No, but a good trusted reader. So, so how do you think the author, the traditional author-editor relationship has changed over the years? I mean, I, I, what's I, your relationship? I like? don't think that, I think it's weakened over the years. And I think Gary, that it, you it's, are it's really a, letting him down. It's unusual. It's, I, mean, I think the kind of relationship we have is unusual. I think that uh, it's, it's bizarre. A, agents... Uh, publishing houses change hands. Agents uh, convince writers to move to the highest bidder. Um, uh, I don't think there are a lot of long-time edit editorial relationships. relationships. And what about the, the kind of relationship? So in other words, it, it's my sense that it used to be a kind of... Um, uh, an editor would see something in a writer that they admired or were drawn to and then would build on that. Whereas I'm not, I don't get that sense that much anymore. Do you, are you buying things that you s see have potential but, but as opposed to... I've never, I, I've never bought potential. Right. <laughs> I mean, that's... Good news, sort of, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> no, I buy when people get to the point where I can do something for them. You know, an MFA program, they're into buying potential. Yeah. An agent who's not making any investment, they're thinking, if I can sucker somebody into buying this shit, <laughs> then I'll be interested. But, you know, I don't think that any editor or any publisher, you don't, the writer has to be there then we can say, now we can do something. You know, we can help, but we're not, you know, this is, this is not an MFA program. Publishing is a for-profit business, it's very difficult, um, and it would be, I work for the writers who I publish. I don't work for all the writers who might want to be published by us. I live for the, I wake up every morning saying, I hope to Christ I can find somebody, you know, something crosses my desk that I see, okay, let's go to town. And, you know, it doesn't often happen. But, so but, but my main responsibility is for the people I'm working with. The company pays me. I work for the writers I publish. You know, their agents do. I like some of them. Um, <laughs> I really work for them. And I get everybody in my company to work for them. And Carrie, I mean, you, you, you've gone through this. Yeah, I mean, it's. I come from a much more commercial background. And, and what's interesting to me is that... It is well, the same. In YA, there's a lot of editing. And my friends are going through several rounds, but... 
you know, I have my friends who are sort of in the adult commercial world, they'll get one round with their editor. I have a friend who gets 100 pages, first 100 pages with her editor, and that's, and that's about it. And I, and I count my... But they get tired or something? <laughs> they're, just, they're, they're just, you know, my, one of my friends, you know, the book isn't even written, it's coming out in November. You know, it's just, the, the, it's, it's a fast, <coughs> you know, it's, it's the mass market paperback. They, it's, you, you get on a schedule. Um, I mean, t t tell people here about your agenting thing. I mean, that's, uh, I go to a couple of writers' conferences a year maybe, and, and I have people who have published in the Black Warrior Review. I mean, good places. I mean, they're not people who are lunatic. They've, you know, they've gone to good writing programs. They published in good places. And they say, why is it that I can't get a single agent to ever respond to anything? And I said, I don't know. You'd have to ask an agent. It is very difficult for a new writer to get an agent to represent him or her. Well, so it used to be that the sort of traditional path to publishing a book would be you would query an agent, right? You would, you would, if you were lucky, you had a couple of agents who were interested, you would talk to those agents, you would get an agent, you would send out to publishers, you would publish your first novel and fame and fortune would follow, right? Um, so, but that's really changed in recent years, right? I mean, I know that's still happening. I think that's, I mean, that's exactly how, I, my, I was a cold call agent. Like, I have a lot of friends who say you have to go to conferences. My dear, you know, Jim McCarthy, you've never met me before in my, my life. You bought a zombie book, you're not gonna be the one to laugh at me. And, you know, and, and I, I So got, you just researched agents who had represented other zombie books. I, I researched all these YA agents, and I chose him merely because on Publishers Marketplace, I had seen he had sold a zombie book. Right, so but that's a, that's a but, very traditional route, right? I mean, is, but it yeah. seems to me things are changing, yeah. for better or for well, worse. But, in but Carrie makes a good point. I mean, you know, whatever it is that you like to write, figure out who represents the writers you like. I, I, I found an agent. Uh, Vince, actually, Gary had already pretty much accepted my book. I found you the my agent. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but, but the, reason, the reason that I was interested in this particular agent is I, after Gary had agreed to publish my book, I still needed an agent. And, and, and I chose someone who represented, uh, represented writers that I liked, that we, like Raymond Carver and Richard Ford and Tobias Wolfe. And, yeah. and I thought, well, if she likes them, then maybe she'll like me. Yeah. And that's... Uh, and for better or worse, it seems that the agents are the first uh, point of entry for new writers. And it's, and it's a big hurdle, you know, I say that, and, and, and I'll say, I know, I don't understand why these people don't read anything, don't pay any attention, are rude, are horrible. But if you get one, you've cleared a hurdle. That's proven yeah. something. I mean, when, and I get all sorts of stuff from people who like writers I publish or what whatnot. And if they've gone to a decent writing program, if they've published something somewhere that means something, these are all reasons that I would not give it to my assistant and say, get rid of this immediately. You know, I mean, they they you have to prove yourself. Getting an agent is proving yourself, and I think it's probably the hardest thing nowadays. And I hear it from people who have really done the work. And I don't understand how, and I, and I read a lot of this stuff, even though it's not agented, um, how could somebody not take this up? But, but did you buy it? Very occasionally. But I read it apparently more faithfully than agents. a lot of agents would. I mean, it, it, it's a very hard road. I mean, Richard Ford used to be famous for, you know, people would say, you know, could you give me some ideas about, you know, how to go ahead making a career as a writer? And he said, yeah, first thing, think about if there's anything else in the world you could possibly do <laughs> and do and when it. And the answer is no. <laughs> and then if you go through all your various possibilities and say, yeah, I couldn't do any of those things, then he said, good luck. <laughs> because you really have, it, it's, it's an individual forge your own way deal. Um, 
I'm going to ask one more question, and then I'm going to turn it over to the rest of you guys. But um, so, so I think one of the things a place like Williams reinforces is the very American belief that if we work hard enough and do well enough, we will succeed. Um, so I'm wondering whether that illusion is um, particularly painful in the life of a writer, or any more particularly painful than it is in any other field. I think it depends on what your definition of success is. Um, I think that um, I, I know people who publish their 13th book. If, what you, if, if your success is finishing a book, yes, I think hard work will get and you. And getting it published. And getting it published. I do think hard work can get you there. And I think it's luck. It's, it's, I, having watched so many friends go through this, it just feels such luck of who picked it up and, and read it and said something on their blog. I, I met a writer at a... Um, at a uh, signing, and she happened to remember my name, and she has a huge following. And so she talks about my book on her blog. She's asked me to blurb her book. She's in my anthology. It was blind luck that I happened to be at her signing. It was blind luck that sort of all of these things are flowing from that. And so I, I really do think that hard work gets you so far, and then beyond that, it's, it's a lot of luck. Well, yeah, it's not. It's, unfortunately, it's not like law. If you go to law school, chances are you will get some a, a job as they a say lawyer not somewhere. Not nowadays, not so much. Well, right, right, right. well <laughs> um, going to, go, unfortunately, going to um, to graduate school in creative writing does not mean that you will become John Irving or Salman Rushdie or take your pick. Um, it, it, it's it's um, it, 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 it's a little bit um, you know it, 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 it's. There, there, there are no guarantees, and so um, uh, supreme self-confidence is kind of a prerequisite. Well, but but I would say, and and you know, we were talking about Jay reading, you know, all this slush, and you know, I get all this, uns you know, unsolicited stuff. I thought when I got into publishing, and I said, Jesus Christ, I mean, people get paid to do this, and I was an assistant, so I was I was getting very poorly paid to get coffee and stuff. But I'd spent my whole life reading books, that, not all of which I loved and adored, but they were all books at a certain level. I started learning, once I saw, saw what you know, the wannabe writers were sending in, I was seeing a different kind of book altogether. And you know, virtually all of it's trash. But I can say, and this was true when I came into publishing 30 odd years ago, if you're really good, you will get published. If you are patient and at all diligent about figuring out how to go about it, how to get some agent to represent yep. you, how to get some magazines to, you know, quarterlies to publish you, if you're really good at what you do, you will have success. Yep. You will get published. And then as Carrie says, then there is so much luck involved. There are people who are moderately talented writers who get some, you know, blind luck, and suddenly, you know, you think that, you know, they're in the running for James Joyce. <laughs> but you have to, you know, and as Jay says too, I mean, belief that you're doing something that you want to be doing, that you can do, and that you're willing to bring as far as you possibly can, you can make it. You know, the electronic feature, nobody knows. There's not a person in this room, and me least of all, who can say what e-books and all this other crap will do. But I don't think, people have had so many distractions in the last hundred years, I don't think e-books is gonna kill book reading. Um, I wouldn't let that dissuade you. Well, and when you said the perseverance, I mean, I think it goes back to what you were saying earlier about having to write every day. And um, because the F-bomb's already been dropped, I feel like I can say this. Uh, one of my favorite quotes is by Nora Roberts, who says, the muse is a fickle bitch. And um, a lot of authors wait for that muse to come to them, and that's how they write. And then when they finish, they- That never works. They send it out. Yeah. And um, you know, I, Jim can attest to the fact that I was not a reviser when I was in college. Uh, and it wasn't until and it wasn't until that first book when I said and I I, I revised that book longer than I actually you. wrote it and and to me that was a huge you know it's 
there's there's this beautiful idea of what the writer is, and and sometimes the reality is, you know, a Christmas Eve sitting in your sister's bathroom so that no one can hear you sobbing on the phone to your husband saying, I can't do this. You know, it's I have a book due, and I this is I have my dream in my hands, and I'm going to lose it. You know that, and what you do is you say, it's due. <laughs> I, I have to turn it in, and. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't want anything else. Like even on the worst days, this is this is the absolute job I would have always wanted growing up, and that I it's it's my absolute dream job now. That seems like a good place to open it up to you guys. So it is a meritocracy, and it's a dream job. <laughs> so everyone should be a writer. <laughs> I'm thinking about quitting. Yeah. <laughs> Are there questions? Yeah. But, but, but it's a good question, and it's one that comes up quite a lot. Um, I never know the exactly how to answer it because, on, on on the submission end, when when any editor, whether it's fiction or nonfiction, when I first started out, I would write long, detailed letters of rejection, saying why I didn't want this here are the problems. They would come back to me with all those problems fixed, and it was still not good. So on, on the submission end, I don't think you ever got much advice. But once a book is bought, it is the editors, you know, whoever bought that book is responsible for that book and owes that writer the closest reading that writer would, would ever get from anybody. Um, I've got friends, you know, the only friends I've got are people who look at it that way. I hear of other people, but, but editors never show one another what they do. It's like, look at this. <laughs> um, I've really worked so hard on various books, and, including some nonfiction books, only to see reviews saying, good God, didn't, this could have been a good book if somebody had bothered to edit it. <laughs> you know, so it's, I can't answer the question, you know, I mean, certain places, I keep hearing that at certain commercial houses, people have to turn things over so fast and they're supposed to make so much money. I've always thought the fewer books that an editor publishes, the better they're going to lose less money. You know, you publish more, you're going to lose more. Then we'd have to fire you. <laughs> Spend more time, you know, bringing a book to market. It's no doubt that there are too many books published in this country and, and every country in the world. Not from a writer's point of view, perhaps, but from any commonsensical point of view, we overproduce. But I don't believe that any book without you know, painstaking care should get to the marketplace. Um, on the other hand, we, you know, we have all of these self-publishing venues and every, you know, I mean, anybody in this room could publish a book tomorrow. You just mail it to somebody, email it to somebody, and there it is. Nobody will ever know about it, but um, I can't. I think it's probably not entirely true that people just let things go by because it makes my blood boil. I mean, I would not let anybody in my company do something like that. Um, but editorial principles differ all around the world. I like to say that English editors will occasionally edit. Um, French edit editors occasionally pretend to have read it. <laughs> Italian editors pretend to have read it and then they give it a prize when they publish it a, a month later. <laughs> you know, if it works for them, I mean, but I just know what I can see. But it's a fair question. But it, it is the absolute responsibility. I mean, if you're doing something, if you are your author's advocate, you do everything starting there and all the way through. And then, otherwise, you should be horse whipped and driven out of town. <laughs> you have Gary's permission to do that to your next editor. Yes. <laughs> well, 
Well, I, um, I have to um, be honest that the, <clears throat> the slush pile period, not so much, but uh, the, the New Yorker period, which I described earlier, became um, the background for my first novel, Bright Lights, Big City. Um, I, I, you know, somewhat, I disguised my uh, um, experience uh, by calling the New Yorker Manhattan Magazine instead of the New Yorker, but um, I don't think that many people were fooled in the end. And um, yeah, you know, being fired from the New Yorker was the most painful thing pretty much that had happened to me up to that point in my life. Actually, though, about the same time, my wife left me and my mom died. Uh, so those are the three most painful things that happened to me. And as, as it turns out, they became the imp those three horrible experiences became the impetus and the subject matter of my first novel. Um, and I think, you know, probably up to that point, uh, nothing, nothing terribly bad had happened to me, and um, I probably didn't have that much to say. So um, I do think that the problem with going directly from um, college to graduate school in creative writing might, might be that you, you don't have a whole lot to write about. Um, Carrie? Well, I think the whole problem with going from college back to school is that um, once you have a couple of years out in the real world, you realize how much you really love school. And it was actually really great to go back. Um, I write about zombies, so of course that worked with lawyers. Um, <laughs> uh, I, don't, I don't think that necessarily helped. I think what helps you, I, people say write what you know, and a lot of times people take that as like, you know, I know zombies, or I know basketball, or I know law. Like a lot of people ask me if I'm writing law law books, and and the way that I the way that I think about it is write what you emotionally know. And so you know you take those moments of of terror of your future of, you know of is this is this really the life? You know, um, a lot of what I deal with in my first book is loss of memory, is of of looking at your parents' lives and realizing that perhaps. You, you always look at them and think that they are the ideal and you realize that their lives are not the dream that they had. And if their lives aren't the dream that they had, maybe that means that your life is not gonna be the dream that you had, which is I think sort of a terrifying moment when you're sort of coming out of college with your, you know, the bright, the, the bright future ahead of you. And so I think, I think you have to absolutely live life to have experiences and it may not be in the, in the day to day, but it's, it's in those emotional encounters that you have that you can draw from. And so I think that's actually one of the problems sometimes with being a full-time writer is what I can draw from is my dog likes to lie on his back on the couch, you know? And so, um, you know, and, and I think one of the difficult things with being a writer is that you have moments like my, uh, my stepfather passed away over the holidays and you have moments when he was literally dying. I was in the room and, and there's just always that part in the back of your head that thinks, you know, I can use this, I can use this. Like, what does this feel like? How would I describe it? And I actually have, where I've written in, in journals at the time, this is what it sounds like, this is what it smells like, this is what it feels like. And, and there are times where you feel like you kind of want to be able to protect those parts of your life, that when you're crying on Christmas Eve, you're not saying, this is what it feels like to, to be sobbing so wholeheartedly because you just want to say enough. Um, but you, you know, if, I, think, I think a writer's mind is always cataloging and always thinking of how would I describe we're horrible people. It's really, <laughs> really? What you're really reptilian. Yeah, emotional vampires. Yeah, yeah. Any other questions? Well, I think um, I think I think it's often easy, and I'm not saying that you're doing this at all. But one of the things that I do run into is an, is people underestimating young adult novels as as sort of uh, you know there's an adult and there's a young adult, and I think that young adult books often often have to deal a lot more with um, kind of the horrors of life. You know, as a young adult, the first time that your best friend betrays you. As adults, it's happened before. It stinks, but you kind of know how to deal with it. But as a teen, it's the end of, it's the, end of the world as you know it. Um, I think the way that I use zombies, or try to use them somewhat thematically, although I don't think that's a starting point for a book to sort of think theme for me, but um, is, is that zombies sort of represent existence for pure existence sake and as a teenager and I think even through college you sort of have that same feeling of what is what what do I bring life other than just occupying space because if all I'm going to do is occupy space why am I fighting so hard and why don't I just give in and and sort of become a zombie and so to me I think that's a lot of what teenagers in all all, all acts of life I mean even as a lawyer dealing with is what am I going to bring to my life what what meaning beyond simply I sit here and I breathe and my heart beats. So I mean I think I think that I, I don't think I deal necessarily with the commercialism. That's a very sort of Romero loves to deal with commercialism. He loves to deal with um, 
you know, how we as a, a culture are unable to solve world problems. I think I try and deal with it on a much more personal, personal level. Who are we? What do we retain in ourselves? If I could question? interject just one thing, I mean, I, I still don't know what a zombie is. <laughs> you know, I, and, we'll and you die and Carrie, come back you know, to life. I, I will be, I will be educated. <laughs> However, the whole YA thing, which I also don't understand, but we publish at Knopf, Carl uh, Hyatt. But jump right in here, Gary. <laughs> <laughs> my ignorance is, is my introduction. Carl Hyacin is, is somebody who publishes very, you know, successful, very stylish, kind of commercial sorts of books for adults. Um, and then he's written YA, which sell more copies than his very successful adult book. Um, I wish I knew Talk more about this Hill. stuff, but what the hell? Yeah. Well, it's like, you know, YA right now is, is one of the few sectors of bookstores that they're growing. It's like eight, up 18%, but that was a Borders number, so we can't really trust Borders numbers mm. these days. But, um, but I mean, I think the numbers... Well, they're fixed in stone now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but the numbers are pretty astounding, and I think you also see, if, if anything's on the edge of YA, like Carl Hyacin, I think they will push it into YA. Like, en Ender's Game is now published, YA Outsiders. You know, um, anything that can sort of fit the in, into those shelves, they will simply because it's selling. And I think mm. ten years ago, those books would have been pushed adult. Our our friend Candace Bushnell just started writing oh, young yeah. young adult novels after a very successful Gary, Gary. successful career. She's ever being a young uh, a young adult herself for quite a long time. <laughs> <laughs> can we take one more last question, maybe? Yes, in the back. Uh, for me, it was reading Dylan Thomas. I just, um, specifically Child's Christmas in Wales, and I just thought, wow, I, uh, this is amazing. I, um, I can't believe that. I, I mean, I'd, I'd always liked books and stories, but then I just suddenly saw writing as um, something that I really wanted to do. I started writing poetry, but that, that, that was the moment. I was about 13, I guess. I, I wish my answer was that romantic. Um, to me, books where I just always love them, like authors are my rock stars. And um, my sister t uh, went to Williams and during a winter study course, she took a class on the romance novel and brought home one of her texts, Dangerous Bodies, and I forget what it was, but it was a text about romance writers talking about how they became writers. And I read one of the essays in which the, she said, I became a romance writer because I read a book and I thought I could do better and I sat down and wrote a book. And I thought, oh, that's what it takes because, you know, it, 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 this sounds so dated, but before the internet was so widespread, you couldn't, you couldn't go to my website and say, how did you become a writer? You couldn't read, you know, articles and articles of both of these guys to figure out how they got to where they are. You just sort of had to figure it out on your own. And so that was just that, that click of, oh, I can do this. And then um, I was too young, I felt like. And so it wasn't until uh, spring break of my senior year that I thought, oh, I have to do this. And so I started writing romance Wait a minute. They're, they're teaching romance novels yeah. at Williams now? Yeah, winter study. <laughs> oh, winter study. Okay. Yeah, winter study. <laughs> Jim, do you know about this? I don't know. <laughs> well, I think really on that note, I want to thank all of our panelists for being here. And thank you for coming. <laughs>